We've been doing this teaching, and I'm, this tonight's going to be the end, even though I could go on. But just really enjoying a season of teaching on identifying true biblical prosperity. And why do I do that? Why do I do certain things like this? There are different subjects I like to cover. Because sometimes people have, they either, uh, they either are, they have a distortion when it comes to prosperity, uh, either, either to the left or to the right, either they don't believe anything that, you know, take the poverty oath or they get excessive to believe that everybody should be rich, rich and wealthy. And I just wanted to try to bring it across uh, biblical, the biblical perspective and not try to pull things out and try to make the Bible say something that doesn't. How many believe that God wants to bless your life and increase you? Everybody should believe that because that's the truth. Uh, poverty, is of, of, uh, poverty is the curse. Poverty and lack come to, from the curse side of life. Before Adam transgressed, there was no such thing as poverty and lack. Would you agree with me? Say amen. amen. No, no such thing. But then we, beginning this series, you know, we talked about the fact that the, the greatest commodity in the earth is man's spirit. God gave heaven's best to restore us back to God so that we could get back to him and not only love and serve him on this side of heaven, but when we step into eternity, praise God, that we would be with him. I told Tammy today, she said to me, you know, I would like to see my grandchildren grow up. And I said to her, I said, you will. I said, you will. Because I believe with all my heart that because God is a family God, Amen. that when those that step over on the other side, the only thing that separates them is the veil of the flesh. Amen. Do you understand that? The only thing. The veil of the flesh. We cannot reach out and touch the unseen because we're ca held captive in this body. Many years ago, I almost drowned in Cancun. And out of that experience, I got extreme claustrophobia. And it was, it was bad. And um, one day I got to thinking that how that I was held captive in this body. And I began to hyperventilate and my body began to rush. And, you know, and I had to transition my thoughts somewhere else. But but um, you have to understand that we were meant to live forever. That's why these bodies fight to stay alive, because we were meant to live forever. And we will live forever Amen. in new glorified bodies. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. That's what I like. Praise God. Amen. And I said, you will. You will absolutely watch your family. You will feel it. You will rejoice. You will, you will praise the Lord as you enjoy watching them grow up. If the Lord uh, tarries and, and you'll watch them grow up and you'll, you'll watch them, uh, you know, all the challenges of life, but you'll be there supporting them. I believe that. I really believe that with all my heart. Now, I had um, my nephew was murdered back, uh, uh, what now, 12, 13 years ago. It was, well, no, it would be, um, it, was in, it was in 2011, so that'd be 11 years ago. Uh, 11 years ago next month on November 5th. And uh, he had, uh, was murdered and... Uh, and now maybe three to five, not over five, I'm not trying to, you know, it, you know, stretch it, but between three to five times at different times. They weren't seeking it, they weren't looking for it, but they'd come home from somewhere and all of a sudden they step into the house and he only wore one fragrance and the fragrance was just filling the house. Amen. And they just really, it was just God. How many believe that God can do anything he wants to? No, we don't set up candles and have seances. But if God wants to manifest a loved one in your life to bring comfort to you, God can do just that. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, whatever you want to believe. I believe that. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Well, if I go before Vicki, I'm going to come back and just give her a hard time. No, just anyway. So praise the Lord. I believe that. I'm, so I'm excited. Why am I excited? Because so, you know, you're just young kids. You got all your life ahead of you. You know, I'm on the last part of them. I'm on the last, you know, lapse of the race. And so I'm just happy that I lived all these years because I, I really didn't believe I'd live to be 20. And now I'm it's going on 73. And a wonderful wife, wonderful children, wonderful, uh, awesome in-laws. I mean, just, I got the best. I got the best grandchildren. Hallelujah. You got wonderful. I got the best. You got good, but I got the best. Praise <laughs> the Lord. Amen. Beloved, I wish above all things, this is Paul writing, excuse me, John writing to a guy by the name of uh, Gaius or Gaius, 
and he was a successful businessman who was supporting ministries, including John's in his day. So his prayer, of course, for him was, beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And he was saying, John was saying, I pray that you will prosper in every area of your life. Raise your hand if you want that for your life and the people around you. Amen. Every area of your life. So as God's kids... I believe it is God's will for us to prosper in every area, first and foremost, spiritually, and then, of course, physically, emotionally, uh, relationally, economically, and financially. I believe God wants us to prosper. The word prosper means to help on the road, to succeed in reaching. I love this word. It's exactly what it means. I'm not adding anything, taking anything away from it. It means succeed in business affairs and have a prosperous journey. Hallelujah. So God wants your life to be blessed. He just doesn't want the blessings to have you. Do you agree? Say amen. amen. He wants you to be blessed, but he wants to make sure that he's first and foremost in your life. So Paul, in his first letter to Timothy, we've read this before. I just wanted to cover it. He, he, he just doesn't want, excuse me, in his first letter to Timothy, he warned Timothy about those in the church who were in trouble spiritually because of their priorities. Meaning what? Their love for the temporal exceeded their love for the eternal. So let's read this. Jesus. Um, uh, Paul says to Timothy, for we brought nothing into the world, and obviously we cannot take anything out of the world. I heard this joke about the very wealthy man who was dying, and he made his wife sign a pet, uh, petition or uh, uh, um, that all of his money would go with him in the casket, all of it. And so later on, you know, somebody said, how in the world, ma'am, did you get all that money in his casket? He said, well, simply, he says, I just wrote out a check. Smart woman. So we brought, I know that's old. I just, I don't even know if I told it right, but it was funny. For we brought nothing into the world, and the Bible says we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, now just again, Americans, we understand the abundance that we're surrounded by. We understand, you know, I mean, if you've never been to third world countries, uh, we were in Russia back in 83 and in 86 during communism. You talk about oppression. You talk about going into grocery stores and 90% of the shelves are, are empty and they're standing in a two city blocks long just to pick up some potatoes for supper. That's what communism is. That's what socialism is. That's what you don't want in your life. Amen. So, but he said, if we have food and clothing, uh, uh, it's, which is exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 6, with these we shall be content or satisfied. But those, now he's addressing Christians, those who crave to be rich, they fall. Say they fall. They fall. You know, it didn't say they might fall, it's possible they'll fall. No, Christians who crave to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish, useful godless and hurtful desires that plunge men or believers into ruin and destruction and miserable perishing. Well, that's not good. That's never the will of God that that, that happened. Then he says this, because I wanted to remind you again, for the love of money, that word love of money is not in the Greek. It says for avarice or avarice. That's the word avarice. For avarice or the extreme greed for wealth or materialism is a root of all evils. It is through this craving that some Christians have been led astray and have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves through with many acute and mental pangs. But as for you, O man of God, Timothy, flee from all these things. Aim at and pursue righteousness, right standing with God, and true goodness, godliness, faith, Love, steadfastness, or patience, gentleness of heart. Fight the good fight of faith, laying hold of the eternal life to which you were summoned and for which you confessed the good confession of faith before many witnesses. Amen. Paul was telling Timothy, man, if you set your heart on, uh, on your love for the temporal, you're going to let go of the eternal. And you see that in life. And as Americans, because of materialism, because we're bombarded 24-7, uh, baited constantly um, uh, through the different avenues of media, that, that we're constantly, it's constantly before our minds that what we have is not good enough. We need something different. We need to be content. If you agree, say amen. So God wants us to increase. 
but not at the expense, listen, of his kingdom in you. In the parable of the unjust steward, Jesus said this, if you have not handled the riches of this world with integrity, why should you be trusted with the eternal treasures of the spiritual world? And if you've not proven yourself faithful with what belongs to another, how many believe that everything you have belongs to God, but he's just asking for a tithe? So if you have not um, been faithful with what belongs to another, why should you be given wealth of your own? It is impossible for a person, a believer, to serve two masters at the same time. You'll be forced to love the one, or that's God, and reject the other, that's money. One master will be despised, and the other will have your loyal devotion. So your choice between God and the wealth of this world is no different. You must enthusiastically love one and definitely reject the other. Wow. I mean, we talk about prosperity, we talk about money, but which one are, are we going to, you know, what are we going to love? What, what, are we, what are we going to be devoted to? Right. And if one thing maybe that happens at this time and season of our lives when, you know, again, I remind you, uh, interest rates now for housing has gone up to over 7%, and it's slowing, you know, s- slowing the process of buying homes down. But when we came here, it was 18%. And there was something in us. It was just the youthfulness, the, uh, not, not, the, you know, not that we were over-spiritual, but there was something on the inside of us that we didn't even think 18%. We thought vision, building the kingdom. Amen. And because we did, God honored our devotion to him. Amen. Yes, there were lean times. Yes, there were. But God always provided. Amen. Always. And God, if you keep your faith in him, you keep your, your, the, first, the, the first and foremost thing of your love for him. He will always provide for you. He's not seated on the throne and G- talking to Jesus says, what are we going to do? The interest rates have gone to 7%. How many have their faith in God? Amen. That's the way to have it. Amen. Hallelujah. So. Throughout your Christian journey, your uh, love for God will always be tested through the means of your giving. The Pharisees, though they tithed on everything down to the mint leaf of their garden, their giving had nothing to do with their love for God and, their, and, and his will. Here's what Jesus said. He called them out and said, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites? For you're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the most important aspects of the law. Justice, or uprightness, mercy, and faith. Yes, you should tithe, but don't neglect the more important things. So uprightness of heart, mercy, and faith is just as important or even more important than giving. Because you can tithe, and if you lack these things, your tithing doesn't do any good. Isn't that something? We'll talk about more of this thing called management in a moment. So Jesus was saying, you can be just as hypocritical as a believer by bringing your tithes to the storehouse, but inwardly, things aren't right. You're offended. You hold unforgiveness in your heart. You show little mercy, even though God has shown you great mercy. And because of your, that you're out of love, your faith doesn't work because faith works by love. Mm, Isn't that good? That's good? Anyway, Matthew 25. We're going to go here for a little bit and end up in Corinthians if we have time. Matthew 25, Jesus was teaching the disciples the parable of the talents. Okay? What is a parable? A parable is a natural story to reveal a spiritual truth. Okay? So... The Passion Bible I'm going to read, verse 14. It'll be up here. Again, heaven's kingdom, Jesus said, is like a wealthy man who went on a long journey. Heaven's kingdom is like a wealthy man who went on a long journey and summoned all his trusted servants and assigned his financial management over to them. So, this parable, Jesus used it for two reasons. Number one, Excuse me, Jesus uses a parable for two reasons. Number one, to conceal a spiritual truth. Number two, to reveal a spiritual truth. 
Don't lose me now. But that's why I use parables. To conceal, to, to conceal the spiritual truth and to reveal the spiritual truth. That's why he, he talked like that. Conceal a spiritual truth from those who aren't willing to receive it and reveal a spiritual truth to those who are willing to receive it. Amen. Isn't that good? Yeah. Pastor Vicky said something, and I, I'm not sure if I'm accurate when, uh, in what she said. I mean, exactly, but she said, God will speak to you when you're willing to obey. And a lot of times you don't hear from him because he knows we are not going to obey him because he's not, so he's not even going to waste his time. Raise your hand if you want answered prayer quick. Well, then you're going to be tested on a daily basis. And most of the testing is relational. And you'll be tested. And then think about the testings of life. Do you know why Jesus was so disappointed in the scribes and Pharisees? Because they had studied the Bible their entire life and still refused to obey it. That's why he was disgusted. They were to represent God. God's love, God's compassion, God's mercy. They they were to represent discipline. Uh, They were to represent, I mean, everything that God was. And they failed in every area because they became, this is what the Lord told me years ago. I, I just thought about it today. He said, there are three things we are without a Christ-centered life. We are self-righteous. We're always right. We're self-ruling. We want to be in control. And we're self-indulgent. It's all about me. And we all think and relate to all those things. (laughs) Oh, I don't know. I'm preaching better than you. Yeah, I know you're just listening. Or you're saying, man, I hope he gets over this quick. I mean, Again, heaven's kingdom is like a wealthy man who went on a long journey and summoned all his trusted servants and assigned his financial management over to them. So now we know that this parable is about stewardship. First of all, over the most valuable resource a believer has, that's the management of his own spiritual life, okay, which includes every other area of life. Now, let's, So I'll write, whether or not we like it, listen, God has assigned us to be faithful stewards over our spiritual lives. Faithful stewards over our natural lives. Stewards, listen, just listen to this. Stewards over our own thought life, our own emotions, our own words, our own actions. Stewards over our marriages, over our families, over our businesses, as well as over our finances. Bringing all of it under subjection to the will of God revealed in the word of God. No wonder we need help. No wonder we need help. No wonder we need the Holy Ghost. Just think about that. What we are called to steward. There's no excuses. We can't blame our mate. We can't blame the preacher. We can't blame our fellow believer. Because if we steward our lives as God requires, love would rule. Our families would be at peace. Our marriages would be sound. Did you know there's a lot, and there's some beautiful homes. You know, when we first got here, we would just dream. In fact, a realtor was driving us around trying to find a place for us to live. And, she, you know, and she said, what kind of money do you have? Oh, we don't have any. <laughs> well, then they want to take you, and there's nothing wrong with this. They want to take you to the trailer parks. You know, they want to take you, you know, to places they think you can afford. But we had a bigger vision. And so, of course, we did. We rented a place. We, the first place we rented was a log cabin. It's still there today. It was, it, was, it was heated by electricity. And we were only there three months, but our heating bill was 1100 a month. <laughs> did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, it was. We went, oh, we got to get out of here. <laughs> we got to get out of this place if it's the last thing we have. That's a song. Anyway. <laughs> But God provided for those three months, and then he got us another place. Amen. Amen. Say this out loud. God is my provider. provider. He really is. Amen. He really is. So, but 
Let's go on. Again, heaven's kingdom is like a wealthy man who went on a long journey and summoned all his trusted servants and assigned his financial management over to them. Say trusted servants. Trusted. Amen. That's what he chose, trusted servants, okay? And then before he left on his journey, he entrusted a bag of 5,000 gold coins to one of his servants, another bag of 2,000 gold coins, and to the third, a bag of 1,000 gold coins. Now watch this. Each according to his ability to manage. The one entrusted with 5,000 gold coins immediately went out. He was the doer of the word. He didn't question his master. He didn't doubt his master. He just simply knew. He knew in his heart that his master could trust him. Can he trust you? Can he trust you? See, we who have been serving God the longest have a greater responsibility to do what the word of God says compared to these kids who've been serving God a couple years. Oh, maybe longer, but I'm making a point. That's what Jesus dis was disgusted with, Amen. that these, bless your heart, he, I'm sure, I mean, if he'd have gotten inflation, he'd have called them knotheads because he was so frustrated with them that they didn't catch it. We that have been serving God for a while are far more responsible to be accountable to react to whatever according to the word of God, not according to our flesh. Amen. That's good. It is good. Thank you. The one entrusted with 5,000 traded with the money, and he doubled his master's investment. The same way, the one who was entrusted with 2,000 gold coins traded with the sum and likewise doubled his master's investment. But the one who had been entrusted with 1,000 gold coins dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. One, one translation says, he hid his master's talent. Now, we can go many different ways with this. And we're not, we're not just simply, even though we're talking about finances tonight, if you want to get into the nitty gritty, the most valuable assets in your life is the attributes of God in your life. It's the talents, the giftings, abilities that he's given you. And I just want to encourage you, if God has blessed you with talents and abilities and giftings, use them. Amen. Don't hide them in the earth. Right. I get grieved in my heart when, you know, um, even though I do like the show because of talent, uh, America, the American Idol or America's God, I just kind of, I, I love to see the giftings and talents in people. Right. Okay? But it's so sad when people come out, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a worship leader of my church. And so they're there to compete. But it's kind of sad just because of the fact, are you serious? You want to give up? You want to give up the gifting and talents that God gave you? Uh, and I can understand why. I can understand why sometimes. Just because uh, the church wants everything free. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get over here. They look mean on that side. The church... <laughs> I'm just kidding. The church, the church wants everything free. Yeah. Everything, you know. And the world goes out and pays their many bucks to go watch whatever somebody's at the stadium out here. I've been out there for a couple of things, and I can't understand the thing they're saying, so I just leave. <laughs> That's my age, probably. <laughs> yeah. And so what do they do? You know, well, they, you know, they want to use their talent, you know. Um, it's so funny, Angie... Uh, both my daughters and my son, but both my daughters are extremely gifted in music. Extremely gifted. Extremely gifted. And I think it, it, either of them could have made it. It, it, it. If they would have been young, I mean, at 16 years old, it, it, Angie, Angie never wanted to be, you know, she never wanted to, she's done a public person, you know, where Amy is more public, you know, she likes to, you know, entertain, you know. And uh, she's tried to get on a few of these shows. But if they'd, if they'd had these shows when they were uh, 14 and 15, both of them would have made it. Yeah. Thank God they didn't. But they could have. Yeah. I'm just telling you, they could have. I ain't just saying that because I'm dad. Amen. Amen. Though I'm dad. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm saying it because that's how gifted they are. Absolutely. And uh, so I get, you know, use our talents and giftings. I'm just simply saying, coming back to this, the val most valuable things in your life, use them for the glory of God. Use them for the glory of God. We need help in church. If, if you love working with children, 
They can use you. If you need, uh, you know, whatever, greeters, uh, ushers, uh, you know, chill, all the chill, different children's ministries, there's all, we, we always need help. But use your giftings. Do you know I said, you know, here's another thing. Let me just say this. And because so many times, and I'm guilty. I'll just tell you I'm guilty. I overlook the sacrifice that these precious people make in the nurseries and children's ministries, especially when we have great guests and they can't be part because they're in there. I've never heard anybody complain, but they sacrifice. They, they give up that time to be a blessing to your children. Amen. Amen. Or how about the guys, Sam and others, who served in the children's ministries during the women's conference? Amen. Well, I mean, that's, yeah, it's tremendous. And um, so sacrifice is, is, is required and they're willing to pay it. I believe with all my heart, God, and we do pray that, that God would richly bless them in other areas of life for the sacrifices they make so you can have some peace in here. When the message is being preached, you don't have to ah, hear the crying babies and you know, and, and, and yeah, amen. So, but use your talents for God. You, well, we have our whole life. Use our talents for God. I come down, I, um, I, I play piano. I don't play well, I, I'm not a great piano. Everybody knows I'm not a great piano player. Not even close. But I enjoy playing. So one day, many, many years ago, one day I, I was on the piano. My dad played piano. And he taught us all black keys. And so one day I was playing piano. Uh, I was on the piano. And I said, Lord, would you teach me how to play piano? I said, I just want to worship you. Would you teach me? And I mean, immediately, he responded and taught me the science of the science of the piano. Well, I knew nothing. Even though it's, everybody probably knows it, I didn't know it. Every key has a family. Every key. So all you got to do, okay, I'm in C. What's the family in C? C, F, G, A minor, D minor. Family. What's D? D is G and A. I mean, just different. You learn the family, you can play the piano. Man, that was cool. So immediately I picked that up. And, you know, so anyway, again, not a good piano player, but I love worshiping God. So every Sunday morning I come down here, I get on that piano, and I just worship the Lord. He hears the same songs over and over again. I'm glad I didn't look over at Jesus. And say, Could he sing something else, please? I just think that. <laughs> and then, you know, I, you know, he gives me music, you know, gives me songs. And so praise the Lord. So I use my talents, whatever they are, for God. Yeah. Amen. You say, well, I don't play piano, you know. Well, I've tried. Well, and the Lord said, you can't play piano. Anyway, you, you, but you can do something else. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Don't join the choir if you can't sing. Brother Hagen, Kenneth Hagen, one the, so honored to send her to his ministry before he died, but that guy could not sing. <laughs> they made a mistake and had his mic on. And they were singing, we exalt thee. We exalt thee. I thought, my God, what is going on? What is that? What is that? It was Brother Hagin singing. Because they forgot to turn his mic down. And, I mean, it was bad. I mean, really bad. And so, so, so he, he, he understood early in life that that wasn't his anointing. That wasn't his gifting. Amen. And, and so, amen. But if you can sing, use your talent. Use the talent. Give God that time. And he'll bless and honor you. Can I have an amen? amen? So let's continue on here. So they both increased, but the one hid his talent in the earth. Let's continue. I'll try to pick this up here. And um, what verse am I at? After much time had passed, the master returned to settle accounts with his servants. The one who was entrusted with 5,000 coins came and brought 10,000. Hallelujah. He said, see, sir, I've doubled your money. Commending his servant, the master replied, you've done well. And proven yourself to be my loyal and trustworthy servant. I mean, that's every aspect of your life. You are going to be tested to see if you are a proven servant of the most. Yes, we're children of God. But are you a servant of God? And so the second one was the same way. He got the same blessing, the same reward. Hallelujah. Then it drops down. Then the one who had been entrusted, verse 24, with 1,000 gold coins came to his master and said, Lord, sir, I know that you are a hard man to please and you're, you are shrewd and ruthless. 
Imagine this. You are a shrewd and worthless, bus- uh, uh, worthless businessman who, you talk about disrespect and dishonor. And, um, and uh, 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 let's go on. Who grows rich on the backs of others. Man, such disdain and lack of respect. I was afraid of you, so I went and hid your money and buried it in the ground. So here it is, take it, it's yours. But his master said, you are an untrusting, you are an untrustworthy and lazy servant. If you knew I was shrewd and worthless businessman who always makes a profit, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? Then I would have at least had, had interest and I returned. But because you were unfaithful, I will take the 1,000 gold coins and give them to the one who has 10,000. For the one, who is, has a, the one who has what a faithful and trustworthy heart will be given more until, until he overflows with abundance. And the one who, uh, with hardly anything, even with the little he has, will be taken. Then the master said to the other servants, now throw this good-for-nothing servant far away from me into the outer darkness where there'll be great misery and anguish. Well, as a Christian, you don't want to live in the dark or you don't want your life anguished. You don't. But I'm just saying the seriousness of the responsibility that you and I have to be faithful to God. If God, I mean, just think about it. Again, this is where I live. Every day, I, I recognize how loving and merciful God is to me. Therefore, how can I not be that to everyone else? Amen. Come on. How can I not be to everybody? How could I not be if I understand the depth of his love for me? And I know you, everybody thinks, you know, a pastor has it together, a pastor, you know. I have every challenge that you have. Amen. I mean, my own daughter said to me today as I went into her office, your pants, Dad, are too long. <laughs> long pants are out. I, and I looked, I said, really? So she pinned them up for me so I look nice tonight. <laughs> That's what my daughter did. And I even have on cool socks, they're short. <laughs> so I just want you to know, I'm cool. I just want you to know. I, I just get one thing down, and they take it away from you. I finally got squeezed into tight pants. Now they're out. I got, I got long pants. Now they're out. I don't, I don't. Hey, the pants I hate is when you lean over and you want to say, say no to crack. I mean, those are the pants I hate, and I've seen that. I've seen that more than I want to. Um, yeah. uh, who, who creates this stuff? Lighten up, we're in church. Hallelujah. So, management. Just want to get back to this as we're winding this down. And I'm not sure I have a chance to, um, no, maybe, I'm not going to read 2 Corinthians 8. Uh, I'll read it later. But management of every aspect of your life, including your finances. Here's what the Lord said through Paul to the church at Macedonia or Philippi. He said, he made this promise. He says, my God shall supply all your need. Not all your wants, not all your desires, all your need, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, remember when Paul also made this statement? Hey, I know what it means to lack. There's been times I have had nothing, and there's times I have enjoyed abundance. But it doesn't move me either way. I am content in God. And if we could find that place within our hearts just to be content and satisfied. And every day you have this heart of gratitude. Every day you have a heart of gratitude. Every day. I'm just telling you. I'm in the pulpit here and I'm just telling you the truth. I'm by myself. I'm always talking to the Holy Ghost. Um, If I say thank you. A hundred times, I, at least a hundred times a day, I'm oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. Have a heart of gratitude. Yeah. And I'm telling you, God honors that instead of a heart of complaining constantly. Yeah. 
That grieves the Holy Spirit. Amen. And manage. Budget. If you're having a challenge with money, I mean, go to, um, uh, what was his name? Dave yeah, Dave Ramsey. He's got steps, keys, you know. I had, years ago, we had Dave Ramsey in here. You know, and it was really good. I mean, not him personally. We, thank you. We did his school. Thank you. And it was good. It helped a lot of people. But I had one couple come up and say, Pastor, you don't understand what? He said, we, we can't afford to budget. <laughs> can't afford to budget. You know the old saying, when your outcome exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. So my point is, if God says he would, my God shall supply all your need. If he says that, and it's not being met, where is the problem? It's not on his end. I'm sorry, it's not. It's on our end. Because God is a good God. He's a faithful God. And he will take care of you if you have an attitude of gratitude and you discipline yourself and not always be spending on things you shouldn't. Can I have an amen? I mean, at this time anyway, until you get that, that, you get that under control. If you agree, say amen. amen. So that's my prayer is that you'll learn how to manage your life, every aspect of your life. Listen to this. If you make a salary of roughly 50000 I just pulled this out of the Google. Uh, if you make a salary of roughly 50000 per year, and you work for at least 20 years, you will end up with a lifetime earning of $1,650,000. So my goodness, the money runs through. I mean, it, it does. I mean, the money, and it takes a lot of money to live today. But guess what? The Father understands that. And he'll take care of you, no matter who you are. I've got women in our, through the years in our church, even today, single women who faithfully tithe. And you're wondering, how in the world do they do it? But they're trusting God, and God provides. I say it, and I had one woman, this precious woman. She was on you know, food stamps and on help, you know. And she came to me one day and said, Pastor, I just want you to know I'm no longer on government assistance. Uh, in, I, I've been, I, I'm, I no longer, you know, have to get food stamps. Uh, God is uh, blessing me abundantly. And I, I don't look down on anybody that needs the help, but praise God is great when we get free from it all. Can I have an amen? amen. And, and we're operating on our own. That's what God wants for you. Amen. Thank you for watching the message. I'd like to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Jesus, I repent of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart, and Jesus, I make you Lord of my life, and I thank you for saving me. If you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Make sure you get into a Bible-based church like Faith Family. Open your Bible and read it daily, starting with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Surround yourself with godly friends that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. We trust that you are encouraged, strengthened, and are ready to fight the good fight of faith. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and share this message so we can reach more people to fulfill our mission of strengthening families through God's word. Let us know in the comments below if you gave your life to Jesus or how this message touched your life. We would love to hear from you. God wants you to know that he is for you, not against you. We love you. We are praying for you and your family. We'll see you next time.